The seeds of many of Morris's ideas were sown in the 1830s and 1840s, when Victorian Britain was becoming increasingly industrialized. Victorian Britain was one of the wealthiest and most technologically advanced countries in the world, but many people viewed the results of industrialization as unsettling, or worse, inhumane. Workers were crowded together in large workshops and factories, and huge numbers of people moved from rural areas to live in abject poverty in cities and towns. William Wilde's painting of Manchester from Kersal Moor suggests the damaging impact of industrialization upon the countryside. Gustave Doré's illustration of a London slum indicates the wretched plight of the urban poor. And the photograph of an 1848 public political demonstration illustrates the growing social and political unrest at the time. The 1830s and 1840s also witnessed a growing urgency in debates about the quality of British design. To many people, the advent of machine production seemed to have encouraged a proliferation of cheap, poorly made goods, while more expensive items were often decorated with an excess of ornament. The garish colours and naturalistic motifs in this roller printed cotton are typical of many machine printed textiles. Joseph Rogers' exhibition knife was one of the many novelty items shown at the Great Exhibition in 1851. And Henry Belter's Rococo revival sofa features elaborate carving, deep buttoned upholstery and veneers, all of which were deplored by critics of design at the time. One of the most outspoken critics of contemporary design was the architect Augustus Pugin. Pugin called for a return to the art and architecture of the Middle Ages as a means of remedying the excesses of Victorian design. A convert to Roman Catholicism, Pugin also proclaimed Gothic to be morally superior because it represented the values of Catholic pre-Reformation England. Pugin's book Contrasts compares the appearance and by extension the values of medieval and modern towns. The tall spires of the medieval churches in the modern town have been replaced by factory chimneys, the old city walls by blank warehouse facades, and the church in the foreground is overshadowed by a prison and an asylum, implying that the Victorian loss of faith has led to crime and insanity. Pugin also laid down rules for the correct use of ornament and decoration. These stipulated that the way that objects were made should never be disguised and that decoration should always be appropriate to an object's function and construction. Pugin's own designs, which you can see on the screen, included simple, undecorated furniture and flat, two-dimensional patterns featuring heraldic motifs and Gothic ornament. His ideas about honest construction, truth to materials, and the appropriate use of ornament had a powerful effect on arts and crafts thinking. Many other critics and designers also extolled the virtues of the Middle Ages, but without Pugin's religious convictions. Previously characterized as a dark and savage time, the Middle Ages were increasingly perceived as a period of unity, fellowship, and stability. The novels of the best-selling writer Sir Walter Scott, who we can see sitting in his study, helped conjure up an age of romance, heroism, and adventure. Scott's home at Abbotsford, on the screen, resembled an ancestral castle, and the view of his baronial hall includes an impressive display of armor and ancient carvings. Scott's novels also encouraged a fascination with medieval pageantry. This fascination is reflected in Daniel MacLeese's portrait of Sir Francis Sykes, where the Gothic flavor of the setting and accessories lends an air of romanticism and dynastic permanence to the family. Dressed in full armor, Sir Francis has been transformed into a knight of the tournament and his young sons into medieval pages and squires. 
William Morris was initially less affected by debates about design than by his love for the history and chivalry of medieval times. Born into a wealthy, privileged family, his childhood was spent roaming the Essex countryside, exploring old churches and reading Scott's novels. Morris's true aesthetic and intellectual awakening began when he was a student at Oxford University. There he met Edward Byrne Jones, who we can see in the photographs, who became a lifelong friend and collaborator. There too, the pair discovered the work of John Ruskin, the most famous and widely read of Victorian writers on architecture and art. John Ruskin's Stones of Venice, with its detailed drawings and descriptions of medieval architecture, demonstrated the beauty of Gothic buildings and the skills of the medieval masons who had built them. His chapter on the nature of Gothic showed how the roughness and irregularity of medieval carving expressed the freedom of the medieval workmen. Ruskin's condemnation of the division of labor and his celebration of the pleasure that medieval craftsmen experienced in completing a task from the beginning to the end became a cornerstone of Morris and the arts and crafts thinking. Many of Morris's later writings reverberate with Ruskinian ideas, and he acknowledged his indebtedness to Ruskin in his beautiful reprinting of On the Nature of Gothic, which you can see on the screen. Fired up by his enthusiasm for these ideas, Morris left Oxford University to train as an architect and Byrne Jones studied painting with the pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti and we can see an image of him on the screen. All three of them worked together on the decoration of Red House, the Gothic house that, Morris that was designed for Morris by his friend Philip Webb and we can see a watercolour and drawing of Webb also on the screen. Red House is important because it gave the, the group valuable practical experience of design and they designed most of the furnishings and decorations themselves and here we can see a few examples of their work. They decorated the ceilings with simple geometric patterns and they painted the walls with scenes from medieval tales. The furniture included massive painted settles and sideboards, sturdy Gothic tables, chairs, candlesticks and stained glass. The group's activities gave them the idea of setting up a new kind of artistic decorating firm and in April 1861 they launched the company later known as Morris & Co. The first products sold by the company were an extension of the products that they had made for Red House and included stained glass, embroideries, tiles and painted furniture. Everything was made by hand and much of the work was done collaboratively with all the partners contributing to the process much in the manner of a medieval craft workshop. <coughs> Stained glass was an important early feature of the company's output and their windows sought to recreate the intensity of colour and clarity of composition that was characteristic of medieval prototypes. Tiles were also popular. Plain tiles were imported from Holland and the partners took turns in painting the designs. Pictorial panels, like Byrne Jones's Cinderella panel, which you can see on the screen, were designed as overmantles and illustrated popular fairy tales. From the 1870s, the production of ceramics was turned over to Morris's friend, William de Morgan, whose designs were inspired by Middle Eastern patterns and the lusterware glazes in Islamic pottery. <coughs> de Morgan's affinity for exotic birds and interlacing plant motifs formed the perfect counterpart to Morris's designs. Embroidery was another important branch of the company's activities. 
Morris believed strongly in mastering the techniques and materials that he was designing for, and he never designed anything that he had not first learnt how to produce with his own hands. His experiments with embroidery began in the late 1850s, and he taught himself traditional techniques of stitching when he lived in London's Red Lion Square. Morris's first designs imitated the appearance of embroidered hangings in medieval interiors. The daisy hanging, which you can see on the screen, has a simple outline pattern adapted from an illustration in a 15th century manuscript. Later designs were more elaborate and were embroidered with luxuriant, stylized foliage. The artichoke, also on the screen, is a particularly significant example that was commissioned for Smeaton Manor in West Yorkshire. During the 1880s, Morris also began designing patterns for smaller items, which were used as cushions and fire screens. These were produced as kits, with the designs printed onto fabric and were sold, and were sold with specially dyed silks and wools for the customer to make at home. Thus, many artistic interiors contained at least one example of a Morris embroidery in the form of a cushion cover or a fire screen. Morris and Company's furniture was divided into two types, what Morris called workaday furniture and what he called state furniture. The state furniture included large, richly decorated settles, like the example on the screen that was painted by Morris's assistant, John Henry Dull. Alongside these unique, expensive pieces, the company sold a range of cheaper, plainer designs. The hugely popular Sussex range exemplified the light, everyday furniture that became a feature of many arts and crafts homes. Based on a traditional vernacular design, it was produced in several different forms and was cheap enough for middle class customers to afford. Morris produced over 100 designs for patterned wallpapers and textiles, all of which were printed by hand from wood blocks. Unlike Pugin, whose designs used Gothic ornament, Morris's patterns were always drawn from nature and contained stylized flowers, fruit, and leaves. But in place of the exotic hothouse blooms favored by commercial manufacturers, most of Morris's patterns used commonplace plants that grew wild in meadows and the countryside. He also supplemented his observation of nature with the study of historical sources. Acanthus, which is the red design on the screen, was one of his most complex patterns. It uses imposing scrolling acanthus leaves, which are derived from medieval ornament. Morris's textiles also demonstrate his commitment to reviving disappearing craft techniques. He had an intense dislike of the garish colors produced by chemical dyes. And when he came to design his own textiles, he used natural vegetable dyes and the obsolete process of indigo discharge printing. This technique was time consuming and extremely difficult, but Morris persevered until he had achieved the deep reds, blues, and yellows that he was searching for. Photographs of Morris in his smock, and you can see one on the screen, that he wore while he was experimenting with dyeing also convey something of the pleasure that he derived from manual labor. <coughs> By the 1880s, the Morris Company was selling everything that was needed for the artistic home. Many of the company's wealthy clients wanted interiors sumptuously decorated with expensive painted furniture, textiles, and decoration. Morris himself preferred simpler schemes, and the drawing room, which is on the bottom in the left, of his London home was comparatively sparsely furnished, with lengths of his bird textile hung around the walls. 
Emery Walker's house, which is the large image on the screen, includes the subtle layering of different patterns in wallpapers, curtains, and upholstery that came to typify the Morris look. Morris's championship of handwork over machine production had a profound effect on later arts and crafts designers. He believed that handwork was not only more beautiful and more skillful, but also, like Ruskin, that it brought pleasure and satisfaction to the maker. The most spectacular example of Morris's use of hand techniques was his revival of large-scale narrative hand-woven tapestries. As with all the other crafts, he first taught himself how to weave. He used the high warp technique favored in the 14th and 15th centuries, where the warp threads are arranged vertically on the loom, and we can see that in the little model of the loom there. With the company's move to Merton Abbey in 1881, Morris set up larger looms, and the company began to produce tapestries on a grand scale. The largest and most technically ambitious of their productions was the Holy Grail series, woven in the 1890s for the dining room at Stanmore Hall. We are extremely fortunate to have one of these tapestries in the exhibition. It's on the screen now. The figures were designed by Byrne Jones, and the backgrounds, backgrounds were by John Henry Dull. Morris was responsible for the heraldic details and for the overall arrangement of the composition. The frieze-like arrangement of the figures and the stylized what were called mille fleurs decoration emulated the appearance of 14th and 15th century Flemish tapestries that Morris greatly admired. Morris's conviction that art should be available to everyone, not just the rich, inspired his conversion to socialism. Initially, he believed that art had the power to change society and to improve people's lives. Gradually, however, he came to realize that art could not flourish until society itself had been reformed. And during the 1880s, he became increasingly politically radical. Ultimately, he called for the complete overthrow of capitalism and the class system, and for a world in which men and women could be free to live lives made meaningful through pleasurable work and fellowship. Morris's politics were inspired not just by ideas, but also by his own experiences. His many visits to textile factories and centers of machine production gave him a deep sympathy for the harshness of working men's lives. He joined the Socialist Democratic Federation in 1883, and he labored tirelessly, writing, addressing meetings, and campaigning to promote the socialist cause. He also used his own money to finance socialist newspapers and leaflets, and to fund political campaigns and organizations like the Hammersmith Socialist League, which he established in 1884, and we can see a photograph on the screen. The Kelmscott Press, which aimed to raise the standard of book art by publishing beautiful limited edition books on traditional presses, was the final achievement of Morris's career. He designed three typefaces for the press, planned the production of 52 books, and made over 600 designs for title pages, borders, decorative initials, and marginal ornament. The Kelmscott Chaucer, which you can see on the screens, was the press's most ambitious undertaking. Jointly designed by Morris and Byrne Jones, it united text and image in beautifully balanced pages. The richly decorated borders, lettering, and type were by Morris, and the woodcut illustrations were by Edward Byrne Jones.
While many arts and crafts makers and designers were greatly influenced by Morris's ideas, few tried to copy his designs. In fact, the movement had no single style, no manifesto, and no formal membership. And it was more about a shared approach to design and making than about a shared aesthetic. The term arts and crafts derived from the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society, whose regular exhibitions of designers and craftsmen's work helped raise the standard and profile of the decorative arts and were extensively reviewed in new magazines like The Studio. And we can see a photograph of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition of 1893 and a copy of the cover of The Studio on the screen. The Arts and Crafts gave birth to many small artist and architect-led organizations, all of whom were committed to the idea of making good design and craftsmanship more widely available. The idea of the guild, with its links to the Middle Ages and the pre-industrial world, was especially popular. The first of the new Arts and Crafts Guild was the Century Guild, founded in 1882 by the architect A. H. McMurdo, who shared Morris's desire to raise the status of the decorative arts and to involve artists in manufacture. Although comparatively short-lived, the Century Guild was important because of its attempts to show how artists and manufacturers might work together in the production of good designs. It had its own workshops for furniture and metalwork, but its designs for textiles, wallpapers, and ceramics were produced by outside manufacturers. And there are two examples on the screen. McMurdo's woven hanging and Herbert Horn's trumpeting angel textile were made by A.H. Lee and Simpson and Godley manufacturers, respectively. Both contain the swirling tendril foliage motifs that anticipate the whiplash forms of Art Nouveau. As the movement spread around Britain, arts and crafts guilds sprang up in regional cities and towns. Many of these had their own characteristics and produced work based on existing craft traditions. Birmingham, for example, had a long tradition of making metalwork, and you can see a light on the screen. The Birmingham Guild of Handicraft was founded in 1890 by the architect and silversmith Arthur Dixon. He produced some outstanding examples of metalwork. The plain design and simple construction of his hand-beaten copper table lamp appeared radically austere compared to most other Victorian lighting. W.A.S. Benson produced similarly innovative designs for light fixtures, and his work furnished some of the most important arts and crafts interiors. Unlike Dixon, Benson was not averse to using machines, but he designed very much within the ethos of the arts and crafts, using simple, functional decoration with joints, wires, and mechanisms left plainly visible. The most recognizable aspect of his lighting, which was the visible electrical cord connecting the light to the power source, and we can see this on the chandelier in the screen, is a perfect example of arts and crafts honesty in design. The arts and crafts emphasis on handwork offered middle class women unprecedented access to decorative arts activities, especially embroidery, book illumination, and china painting, all of which could be carried out in a studio at home. Several women took their work to a professional level. Mae Morris, who we can see on the screen, was an accomplished designer and needlewoman, and she ran Morris and Company's embroidery section from 1884. Phoebe Anna Traquer specialized in foil enamel scenes strongly influenced by medieval and Renaissance models. And Margaret MacDonald, who is in the upper photograph, worked in watercolors, gesso, and graphics, but some of her most successful work was in textiles. 
She was a student at the Glasgow School of Art, where she met Charles Rennie Mackintosh, her future husband, and her embroideries played an important role in their decorative and symbolic interiors of the early 1900s. The arts and crafts interest in more ethical methods of production also led to attempts to regenerate the economies of rural communities. At Hazelmere in Surrey, Godfrey Blunt founded the aptly named Hazelmere Pe Peasant Industries to revive craft traditions and provide employment for local people. His designs for embroidered hangings, and you can see one on the screen, use the simple but effective technique of brightly colored linen motifs applied to a plain background. Comparable endeavors were established at Keswick in the Lake District and at Newlyn in Cornwall. Inspired by the precepts of John Ruskin, the Keswick School of Industrial Arts was established to alleviate local unemployment. It developed a reputation for high quality decorative silverware, and you can see some on the screen. The Newland School produced brass and copper chargers, and these were extremely popular in arts and crafts settings. Although the arts and crafts was predominantly an urban movement, a yearning for the countryside and the ideal of the simple life lay at the heart of much arts and crafts thinking. These ideas were inspired by a desire to get closer to nature and by a nostalgia for the values of disappearing rural communities. They inform both romanticized images of the countryside, like Peter Emerson's photograph of horse-drawn plows, and many arts and crafts wallpapers and textiles, which include country flowers. Some leading figures actually moved to the countryside to establish new lives and to pursue traditional workshop practices. The most famous example is Charles Robert Ashby, who founded the Guild of Handicraft in London's East End, which trained local men to make metalwork jewellery and furniture. In 1902, Ashby relocated his London workshops to the village of Chipping Camden in Gloucestershire, and around 50 staff and their families went to live and work in the countryside. The Guild's most successful work was its jewellery and beaten silver, all made to Ashby's designs. Ashby's Painter Stainer's Cup, and you can see it on the screen, exemplifies the sophistication of his designs. The designer Ernest Jimpson also moved from London to the Cotswolds to make furniture. He learned the craft of chair making from Philip Clissett, a local craftsman whose rush seated ladder back chair is very reminiscent of Morris and Company's Sussex range. Jimson's oak cupboard, with its restrained carving and revealed construction, typifies the extreme simplicity that is often associated with the arts and crafts aesthetic. It is therefore interesting to see that Jimson also designed more decorated items, like this beautiful painted cabinet. The plainness of Jimson's Cotswold cottage interiors, and we can see a photograph on the screen, with its stone floors, plastered walls, and vernacular furniture, perfectly embodies the arts and crafts ideal of the simple life. Arts and crafts architects often proposed new solutions to the layout of the home and advocated more informal styles of living. H. M. Bailey Scott was particularly keen to dispense with small cramped rooms and to open up reception areas to form light and airy living halls. Charles Voisey was an advocate of modest, unpretentious design, and he liked low ceilings, whitewashed walls, and simple oak furniture made to his own design. And we can see his interior at the bottom of the, photo of the slide photograph. 
Boise designed many complete interiors, but it was through his wallpapers and his textiles, like the one on the right of the screen, that he reached a much wider audience. And finally, from the 1890s, the influence and the reputation of the arts and crafts spread to many parts of Europe and America. Each country interpreted the movement's practices and ideas differently, and the exhibition ends with a selection of items that suggest the variety of work that was produced. Frank Lloyd Wright's strikingly modern stained glass illustrates the movement in America. Richard Reimerschmidt's elegant triangular table represents Germany. The emphasis on national traditions that characterize the arts and crafts style in Scandinavia is represented by Lars Kinsavik's Viking chair in the center. The illustrations in Karl Larsson's Et Hem epitomize the Swedish version of the simple life. And finally, the exquisitely crafted chandelier by Joseph Puigi Cadafalque in your own collection exemplifies the sophistic sophisticated adaptation of arts and crafts, ideas and styles in Spain. Thank you very much indeed. I hope that you enjoy the exhibition. I think maybe now you have an opportunity to go and see the exhibition. And please come and ask me questions afterwards if you have any. Thank you.